From the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time, transcribed from the immortal pen of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Tarzan, the bronzed white son of the jungle. And now in the very words of Mr. Burroughs, the story of small packages. Tarzan was always loath to leave his beloved jungle, and he disliked the native city of Bekarata intently. But duty had brought him to the soil, disreputable-looking port that sweltered beneath the equatorial sun. And as he walked along its narrow streets, he formed an interesting part of its colorful hodgepodge of humanity. Had Bekarata been the type of city to attract tourists, they would have looked with great interest at the bronzed white savage who wore a leopard skin and reached up to pet the parrot perched on his shoulder as he entered a shabby warehouse bearing the sign, Hasim al Saad, Imports, Exports. Good morning, Ben Glood. Tarzan, you know that you are not welcome in the establishment of Hasim al Saad, my master? I have no more desire to see al Saad than he has to see me, but I have business to conduct with him. And what possible business could you have with me, Tarzan? I have brought a great quantity of semi-precious stones found by the Punya people. They have authorized me to barter them with you, al Saad. I prefer to deal directly with the Punyas as I have done in the past. Yes, I'm sure you would prefer dealing with them. You're able to palm off items that are worth a fraction of the stones they turn over to you. That's their business and mine. I would not have come to you at all had it not been for the insistence of the Punyas. They they wish to live up to their agreement with you. But I do have their permission to deal elsewhere if you fail to offer suitable goods in exchange for their stones this time. Ah. Well, then, it becomes my humble duty to offer you the best of terms. I, uh, I might even make you an offer for that handsome parrot you carry on your shoulder, Tarzan. Unfortunately, Juanita's vocabulary is limited to the saying of my name. He'd be a valuable bird could he learn anything else, but as it is, he's almost worthless. And I would not cheat you any more than I would permit you to cheat the Punya people. Cheat is an ugly word, Tarzan. I have no desire to give anything but the finest of merchandise in exchange for what you have brought me. Ben Kulib, when is Captain Hawkins' ship due in port? I shall have to consult my records, Master. I shall have the information at my tongue's tip in an instant. Tarzan, to be honest with you, my stock is depleted at the moment. But as soon as the ship of Captain Hawkins arrives from England, I shall have rich goods to offer the people of Punya. There. That proves my good faith, does it not? Hmm, it seems to. All right, I, I shall return when the ship arrives so that I may examine the merchandise before our barter is agreed upon. You may leave the semi-precious stones in my custody in the meantime. There is little reason to transport them back to your jungle. I shall leave them so that the porters need not carry their burden twice. But I warn you, al Saad, I expect to receive full value when the ship docks. I'll not stand for chicanery. You do me too little honor. Ben Kulib, why do you not give me the information I desire? A thousand apologies, most gracious master. Only now did I ascertain exactly when the ship would sail and when it would arrive here. Then out with it, you stupid fool. Captain Hawkins' ship is due in Becorata at the next full moon. Even now, it sets sail from Liverpool. the bales of the docks, you blasted landlubbers. Can't you see there's no more room below? Pardon me, sir. Yes. Well, if it isn't a young gent and all dressed up in an eaten jacket, too. What do you want here? I, I'm looking for the master of the vessel, sir. Well, I'm Captain Davy Hawkins, skipper of this blasted freighter, if it's any of your business. I'm glad to know you, Captain Hawkins, sir. Well, I can't say the same. I don't like dressed up tops, little or big. You state your business and they'll be off. I... I'd like to take passage with you, sir. Oh, <laughs> you'd like to take passage, would you? You know where we're bound. The man in the tavern said you were sailing for Africa, sir. Yeah, that's right. And we're a cargo ship. We don't take passengers, and I've got a full crew. I can pay my way, sir. Look. Well, I'll be blowed. A young one with a fistful of hundred-pound notes. So you want to go to Africa, do you? Yes, sir, very much. Well, maybe it can be arranged. There's only one thing, sir. 
If you go ashore, you mustn't say you've seen me. Oh, I get the picture. You stole the money and those fancy dogs, eh? <laughs> well, Captain Davy Hawkins won't spill things. Besides, I won't be going ashore. We're sailing in a mo. Then it's a deal, sir? You'll take me along? That I will, matey. It's you and me for Africa. And the bobbies will never find you. Why, you're apt to stay in Africa as long as you live. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll continue with our story of small packages. Briarmount, a great rambling manor house in the quiet countryside some miles from London, was usually a peaceful place, a suitable abode for the dignified Earl of Carisbrook. But tonight it was not quiet. Men from Scotland Yard were going over the place with a fine-tooth comb. The telephone kept ringing. An endless stream of telegraph boys wheeled up the long driveway. Special constables trampled the velvety lawns as they looked for clues. And Lord Carisbrook was not his usual dignified self either. He stood in his library, his eyes flashing, his face purple with rage. Well, well, what did you find out? Uh, nothing, sir. Nothing! I tell you, it's a national disgrace. One small boy disappears and the entire constabulary can't find him. Well, there's no use getting yourself all upset, sir. No use getting myself upset. My only grandson disappears as though the earth had opened up and swallowed him. I'm not to get upset. I'm glad his parents aren't alive to see this day. Well, if you'll permit me, sir. Well? Well, I'm sure when Antony skipped a few meals and slept in a lumpy bed somewhere, he'll be home. It always works out that way. Why, there must be hundreds of lads who run away from home every year. They find the going a bit rough and... Certainly a great many lads take it into their heads to run off. But Anthony isn't just another lad. He's my sole heir. Someday he'll have a fortune and a title. The 12th Earl of Carisbrook. If some unscrupulous person got Anthony in his clutches... Oh, no, 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 no. You're too much of a realist to really believe anything as melodramatic as that. How far could Master Antony get with the small amount of money he has left from his allowance at this time of month? Well, there's uh, some truth in that. But I, uh... Yes, yes, for goodness sake, this is Lord Carisbrook. Oh, of course I know it's you, Jenkins. Hard? Huh? Early this morning? Well, why'd you wait until just now to tell me you've seen the young rascal? Oh, you didn't know he's missing until... Well, what did he... All of it? Every last shilling? Of course, of course I told you you used to have full say, but you might have had the good sense to... Oh, never mind, never mind. Good night, Mr. Jenkins. You haven't heard the last of this. Uh, Jenkins saw Master Anthony this morning. Yes. Uh, do you remember the account I set up for the lad so that he could try his hand with stocks and shares? Oh, yes. As I recall, it was so that he'd be able to handle financial matters when he became Lord Carisbrook. You told Jenkins that Master Antony should have a free hand in the manipulation of the account. Well, Jenkins gave him a free hand, all right. <clears throat> this morning, Antony went into their office, told one of the clerks to sell everything, pocketed the proceeds, and left. Oh, but then he had hundreds of pounds when he made off. Exactly. Oh, Melford, Melford, where in the name of heaven do you think the boy's gone? Well, I didn't really consider it seriously until now, but when we went through his room, we found it full of maps and stories about Africa. Africa? Then that's where he's headed. I know it. Shall I send a wireless to our consular service there? No, 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 no. There's been enough bungling on this already. I'm chartering a plane tonight. I'll be in Africa before he lands, and I'll personally contact the consuls in every major city of the continent. Unless some harm befalls him before he reaches Africa, I'll keep him from going into the infernal jungle that must have captured his young imagination. But although Lord Carisbrook reached Africa almost a full month before his grandson, he was unable to anticipate Master Anthony's arrival at such an obscure port as Becorata. While the police of every major port on the continent scrutinized each new arrival... The young English lad, with an appetite for adventure, left the ship at Becorata without the slightest interference and headed for the jungle that appeared so fascinating in the books he'd read. His path came within a few miles of the Lord of the Jungle, for Tarzan was on his way to the city, on his way to see Hassim al-Sad, whose cunning was greater than his conscience. 
Ah, it is my friend Tarzan and his handsome parrot. I have come for the goods that you owe the Punya people. Oh, it is truly embarrassing, but I have not as yet received the merchandise we discussed. But you said I was to return at the full moon, and I, I've already learned that the ship of Captain Hawkins has reached port. Ah, oh, you are clever, my friend. Yes, it is true that the ship has arrived, but for some mysterious reason, Captain Hawkins has seen fit to bargain harshly with me this time. I have been unable to persuade him to part with his goods. I dare say you try to deal as sharply with him as you do with others. No wonder he's reluctant to trade with you. Well, return the precious stones I brought on my last journey, and I too shall deal elsewhere. I'm afraid it is quite impossible to return the stones to you. I have already disposed of them. What? Stay your temper. I mean the punya's no injustice. Once I have made my bargain with Captain Hawkins, I shall equip a safari and bring the goods I owe into the jungle. I shall even include an extra bounty for your patience. The extra bounty is not necessary. But this time you shall be held to your word. Goodbye, Hasim al -Sad. May Allah guide your footsteps, Tarzan. Are there? <laughs> Captain Hawkins, if you anger me further, I shall refuse to do business with you. Suit yourself, matey. I'm in no hurry to sell the goods I've got aboard. For one who is always down to his last gold piece, you show a remarkable disinterest in trade. Oh, I do, do I? <laughs> well, let me tell you this, mister. I am mighty ass him al -sold. I'm not in an hurry to have you do me. No. This time I'm not down to me last farthing. I'm rolling in wealth, I am. After taking a full cargo aboard in Liverpool, you're not deceiving me, you miserable infidel dog. Oh, deceiving, am I? Well, if you think I ain't rolling in money, here. Look at this. Hundred pound notes. Where did you get them, Hawkins? Not your concern, it ain't. I shall make it my concern. I've been waiting months for your shipment, and now that you've docked, you won't sell it to me. I want to know how you got the money that enables you to be so independent. Oh, well, I'm not telling, I ain't. Perhaps your blood will spell out the answer. Yeah, no, I see. No, no, no. Put the knife away. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Ah, that's better. Well? Well, it, it, it sounds like a fairy tale. It does. Promise me you'll believe me. Tell me the story. I'll make up my mind whether to believe it or not after I've heard it. Well, sir, I was standing on deck just before we sailed when a young tough comes aboard. He has all his money, and he offers to give me half to bring him to Africa. So far, I don't believe it, but go on. Well, it seems he stole the money. I brought him here, and I took the other half of the money on the way. Oh, not that I didn't give him value received, oh, no. I traded an old navy uniform for the heat and jacket he was wearing. An heat and jacket? You fool, you sniveling fool. A fool for getting hundreds of pounds for an old navy uniform? You realize who the boy is? He's the heir to the earldom of Carisbrook. All of Africa is searching for him. There's a thousand pounds reward out for him. Well, I'll be blowed. Where is he? Well, I wouldn't know that. He, he took off the minute we landed. Headed for the jungle, he did. Then I'm going after him. Well, you can suit yourself, chum. I wouldn't go into the blasted jungle, not even for a thousand quid. <laughs> a thousand pounds is only the beginning. You see, if Lord Callisbrook is willing to pay a thousand pounds as a reward, he should be willing to pay a hundred times that as ransom. <laughs> In just a moment, the exciting conclusion to our story of Tarzan. Tarzan was on his way back to his jungle stronghold, and his heart was heavy. For once again, he would have to return empty-handed to the people of the Punya tribe. Suddenly, he stopped in his flight through the upper level. From below had come the scent of man and of beast. He held the huge branches of a jungle tree apart so that he could peer down. Below him, Sheeta the panther was engaged in a strange battle with a small boy who wore an ill-fitting navy uniform. The boy had tied a scalp knife to the end of a long stick. Each time Sheeta drew close, the boy prodded the animal and it drew back, snarling and baring its fangs. But its fear of the pitifully inadequate weapon would not protect the boy for long. Tarzan grasped a swinging vine and hurtled downward, his voice raised in the savage cry of the bull ape. Well, our, our friend Sheeta has run away. I shouldn't wonder, sir. That's a frightening sound you make. If I hadn't been dreadfully tired, I would have run away too. <laughs> I doubt that. You seem very brave. What, what are you doing here alone? It's a long story, sir. You needn't call me a sir. My name is Tarzan, and I'm not in any great hurry. 
Well, Tarzan, sir, my name's Tony. Tony Jones. You see, I'm an American lad. American? You don't sound like an American boy, Tony. Oh, but I am, sir. An American orphan. I I lived in an orphanage in Pennsylvania. Uh, that's a city in Philadelphia. Oh, I see. I ran away. They've been chasing me, and, and entering the jungle was the only possible way of escaping them. You won't make me go back. Well, I, I wouldn't want the people from the orphanage in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia to uh, catch you, so if you'd like to cast your lot with mine, you can return to my seacoast cabin with me. I, I'm not sure, sir. I shouldn't like anyone to know where I'm going. Uh, do you live in the cabin all alone? Well, not quite. <laughs> I say, that's a jolly-looking parrot. And he flew right to your shoulder. Does he live with you? Is that what you meant? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, all he can say is my name and awk, awk. I know that you'll be perfectly safe alone in the jungle as long as you have that uh, scout knife in your possession, Tony. But were you to return with Juanita and me, you might be able to teach him some new words. And that, that would be a great favor to me. Well, I shouldn't like to refuse you a favor after you did me one by chasing off that panther. Anyway, I... I shouldn't think anyone could find me at your place, Tarzan. You understand my orders, Ben Kulib? Yes, my master. I want a hundred of the most experienced jungle men who can be found in Bakarata. I want men who are not afraid to use their knives and their guns. The boy must be found, and he must be brought back here regardless of any interference that might be offered. The men are already engaged, El Saud. It is well. I myself shall lead the safari, and if need be, we shall turn the jungle upside down and shake the lad into our hands. And at the same time, shake many gold pieces into our coffers. Is it not so, master? Your words are plated with the gold of truth, my servant. You do not think Captain Hawkins will raise trouble to avenge our raid of last night? No one will cause trouble for Hasim al Saad. Neither Captain Hawkins, the English boy, nor those who will pay ransom for him. For they will discover that the boy will not be alive to describe his abductors. I say, who's coming down to my cabin? Who's there? My name's Carisbrook. Uh, are you Captain Hawkins? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, are you Lord Carisbrook? That's right. Now, uh, tell me, uh, what have you done with my grandson? Where is he? I don't know your grandson, Governor. How could I? He was on your ship when you touched at Mombasa. If the pilot of the port had been on his toes, I'd have known it a week ago. Oh, no, you're on the wrong track, Governor. I don't know the land. Oh, yes, you do. I've checked my facts. You even went so far as to sell the Eton jacket he wore when he left home. I found it in the native shop right here in Bekarata. Well, it's like this, Governor. A villain by the name of Asim Al Saud raided my ship last night. He took me old blooming cargo. Had a hundred men, he did, and I was left without a farthing. So I sold some old clothes off on in the crew's quarters. You can take my word, I didn't even know where that little jacket come from. You do know where it came from, but I'm going to shake the truth out of you. Tell me, or I'll take you back to England and have you hanged until you're dead. No, 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 Governor. I'll, t I'll, t I'll tell you. He, he. He was aboard. It was Master Anthony, yes. But I haven't seen him for days. He, he headed for the jungle, he did. He, he was going to try to reach French Equatorial Africa, he was. He said it sounded romantic. Was anyone with him? No, sir. Anthony, alone in the jungle. Have you told this to anyone else? Only to Asim Al Saud, your lordship. said something that time, sir. Juanita almost said something? I could see him thinking about it. Oh. Tell me, Tony, do you like it here in my jungle home? Well, I've never seen a house quite like yours, Tarzan. The jungle itself isn't quite what I expected. But with all the animals and the snakes and things, I, I have to admit there's never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. Yes, perhaps that might describe my life here. A lot different from the life of England, eh, Tony? I wouldn't know what it's like in England. I meant different from the life... I would have led if my parents hadn't been marooned in Africa before I was born. I, I thought perhaps you might have read something about England. No, sir. In America, we don't read much about Blighty. Blighty, huh? Well, when you go home uh, to America, you, you shall have a great deal to tell about. I have to leave shortly for the Punya village, and, and you shall see a real native crawl, and, and perhaps play games with a genuine little Bantu youth. If it's all the same to you, Tarzan, sir, I'd rather remain here. 
Perhaps I can finish teaching Juanita how to say something else besides Ock, Ock, and Tarzan. <laughs> All right, Tony, but keep the door locked and be sure and eat a good meal before you go to bed. I have to explain something to the punyas, but uh, I'll be home by morning. Goodbye, Tarzan. Have a good journey. Thank you. Goodbye, Tony. Hi, there. He's gone, Juanita. I'll have to leave before he gets back. You see, he's on to me, Juanita. He knows I'm not an American. He'll send me home, and I don't want to go home. I want to explore the jungle. <laughs> Tony? Tony? Where in the world could he... White men. A safari, perhaps. No, no, I shall wait until they approach. I say there, you! Quiet down, men, and wait here. This white savage speaks English. Perhaps he can give me some information. I speak English, but I'm in great trouble at the moment, and I have little time to spare. What, what do you want to know? I'm looking for my grandson, an English boy who disappeared into the jungle. Is his name about... Tony? Yes, yes. You've seen him? He was with me at my cabin a few miles from here until yesterday. I had to go away, but I told him to keep the door of the cabin locked. He was gone when I returned. I've missed him again. Oh, perhaps I'm not destined to find him until it's too late. He left of his own accord. There were no signs of a struggle or of the presence of others. If only my parent could tell me why he left. Oh, it's highly unlikely, and all this talk isn't finding Tony for me. Lord Cannesbrook! Lord Cannesbrook! What is it? What is it, Melford? Have you found something over here? Yes, I think so, sir. Isn't this Master Anthony's scout knife? It might be. Yes, that's the very knife Tony carried. Well, where did you find it? Oh, right by this tree. His, his footprints. And the light impressions of Arab sandals. Hassim al Saud. What about al Saud? How does he fit into the picture? Captain Hawkins, the man who brought Anthony to Africa, told this Al Saud about his young passenger. Al Saud was also apparently aware of the thousand pounds reward I've offered for my grandson's return. Oh. I went to his establishment in Bekurata, but I was informed he was off on a, a hunting trip. Oh, well, then, if he's the chap who's found Master Anthony, we have nothing to worry about. We return to Bekurata, we go to his warehouse, give him the thousand pounds. That's the one thing you mustn't do. Lord Carisbrook, I know Hasim Al Saud. If you've offered a thousand pounds, you'll want ten times that. If the one thing you pray for is to find your grandson alive, it's the one thing Al Saud will seek to prevent. No, we must go to Bekarata. But in dealing with Hasim Al Saud, we must use a devious method. Sentry stood outside of the garret room of Al Saud's warehouse, and inside a small boy lay bound to a crude bed beneath a dull skylight. In the office of the warehouse, Lord Carisbrook bargained with Al Saud for the boy's life. The table between them was piled high with banknotes, but the ruthless Arab was not yet through with his demand. In the streets outside of the building, hundreds of punya warriors in a variety of clever disguises blended with the city's multitude. And over the roofs of the city, a bronzed white savage with a parrot perched on his shoulder crept closer and closer to the roof of the warehouse. And then, just as the sun caused the shadow of a minaret to fall across the window of the office, everything happened at once. Lord Carisbrook leveled a gun at El Saad. The Punya warrior streamed into the building, and Tarzan leaped down through the skylight. Watch out! The guards! I see them! You shall not take You infidel dog! We'll see! Get us! Fully clever with that knife of yours. Yes, it's a, a handy instrument. Also effective for cutting these bonds. There. Tony. Tony, my boy. Uh, you're all right. Yes, Grandfather. But what are you doing in Africa? I, I came to take you home. Are you ready to go home, boy? Yes, sir. I think maybe I'd just like to read about Africa till I'm a bit older. Tarzan, would you be willing to part with Juanita? I'd love to show the other boys in my school what Oh, a... he's yours, Tony. I'm happy to give him to you. And I only wish you'd, you'd been able to teach him something new. Well, perhaps someday I... Never uh, don't, Mama. Never don't, Mama. <laughs> 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 In just a moment, a preview of our next story of Tarzan. Tarzan's respect for the Karmiki tribe had always been great. 
Of all the jungle peoples, the Karmiki had always been the bravest. But suddenly they became a people enslaved by fear. Their leaders were helpless. Their once proud warriors like frightened children and a feeling of unearthly horror filled their village. Tarzan, too, became a victim of their unseen enemy, the ghost of the Karmiki. Tarzan, a transcribed creation of the famous Edgar Rice Burroughs, is produced by Walter White, Jr., prepared for radio by Bud Lesser, with original music by Albert Glasser. This is a Commodore production. Listen to our next story, The Ghost of the Karmiki, another thrilling episode of The Lord of the Jungle. 